Man, that's amazing. Well, good morning, Renew. Good morning. I love it when you guys respond like that. Well, I love that video. I spent um, a couple of hours this week, well, several weeks, watching those videos. That video is from um, a worship ministry called Maverick City, uh, and they call it Behind Bars, and it's literally where they go into prisons, um, and they do worship songs, and they minister to men and women behind bars, and uh, there's just something special about it that caught me, just the unencumbered, the uninhibited um, hearts of those men and women who are physically chained up and, and bound behind bars, and they just release, they just release, and um, you can tell it's really heartfelt when they worship, it's super, super amazing, I encourage you to go look it up for yourself. So, we're wrapping up our Psalms of the Summer, it's been a great series, hasn't it? Yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed it. You know, I enjoyed how we incorporated music and we incorporated worship, but we also incorporated uh, the believer's heart into a lot of the messages. John Dodd's message was awesome last week. I love that man. Uh, he said something that was profound to me that really um, just let me know that, you know, well, Holy Spirit let me know through John that this was the message that I needed to deliver today. He said, we need to have a heart that's prepared to listen. Um, John Dodd, I'm stealing that from you, by the way, so... I love that quote, and to listen we invokes this idea of there has to be something to listen to, and so it's unfair if we walk out of Psalms and we don't talk about sound. We don't talk about just the art of sound. You know, um, it's really cool. The, the study of sound is called psychoacoustics. I wish I would have started a rock band called that personally. I mean, that, <laughs> psychoacoustics is a really cool name. But it's, it's super great and it's interesting. There's all kinds of um, great studies about how sound impacts the human body and both mentally, physically. Uh, and it's just amazing. And ultimately what we know is that the book of Psalms, all 150 of them, are uh, writings of poems and songs and hymns. I mean, even some of them, if you look in, in your text, in your, in your Bible, you'll see things like, uh, this is to be sung with a soprano voice or this is to be sung or played with a lyre or a harp. And so the whole book of Psalms, is, it resonates sound. I don't know, that's just kind of amazing to think about to me. It's like you open the pages and there's sound in the text. It's beautiful if you just think about it. And sound is just an amazing gift that God gives us. Um, and if we just think about it, just think about this. Do you remember the sound of your first child when they cried? Do you remember that? How beautiful that was. Now I know for the parents that's, you know, six months into the child, you know, the baby's screaming and they haven't slept in those six months. Maybe that sounds not so beautiful, right? Yeah, interesting fact. Did you know that a, an infant's cry can be uh, upwards of 110 decibels? That's super loud, very loud. No wonder why some parents can't sleep. Um, <laughs> 110 decibels. But still, there's something about it, even then in your tiredness, and your exhaustion, there's something about hearing your child cry or hearing your child laugh. It's the sound. It's what it produces within you. What about the first time you heard someone tell you they loved you? Maybe it was a loved one, maybe it was your spouse, maybe it was a family member, whatever. Do you remember that? Do you remember the sound of hearing, I love you, how it made you feel, the emotions that it brought forth? Sound is an amazing gift from God. What about the, what about the I do, woo, the I do on your wedding day? Who remembers that? I remember that. Lastly, what about the uh, celebratory happy birthday? These amazing sounds that we receive through speech and auditory responses are a gift from God. And yes, there are people in our lives and there are people and believers and, and alike that, that suffer from hearing impairments. And I don't want to take that away, but God is so amazing that he even takes that idea of sound and he uses it in those moments in people who have a hearing impairment. I found this quote that I want to read with you, uh, read to you about uh, from a, a pastor who had an ear, hearing impairment and how they dealt with 
the loss of hearing and the absence of sound in their life. It's just amazing when you think about it. Um, they go on to say, uh, I listen with my whole body. I listen with my eyes. I can see the joy, the pain, and the sorrow, sometimes hidden in the words as the ears of my heart listen to the person who is speaking to me. See, God is amazing like that. And why it's not an auditory response, it's still a physical and spiritual response, at least for this pastor. And I assume there are other people like that. This pastor looks upon the person as they talk and they conversate, and he can hear their heart. Matter of fact, I love that, that, that analogy. He says, the, the ears of my heart. I love that. So this idea of sound is just a super amazing gift. I mean, it, you know, like that clip that we just watched, those men singing. Here, I don't know about you, but being uh, a men's pastor for a while, uh, there's always been something super amazing and super uplifting to me about hearing a group of men sing. I don't know, there's just something powerful about that when men are unafraid and, um, and, 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 and given over to God and they just lift their voices. I, it's just, I don't know, maybe it's the low end. I don't know what it is. But it's always been amazing. Just like that, that clip, you know, a little off key, a little out of rhythm, but you could tell it was from the heart. They were just pouring pouring it out you know or just like you guys when you respond good morning there's something encouraging about that something uplifting about that for everyone in this room you know sound puts joy and meaning into our days into our life and it can lift up our spirits it can set the tone for our day you see what I did there sound tone it could set the tone for our day. You know, like me, I talk about it a lot. My wife, she wakes up every morning singing at the top of her lungs. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not kidding about this. She wakes up and she just sings. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. Sometimes it's worship songs. Most of the times it's Bon Jovi. But she still sings. Um, but, it, but when I'm there, it does something to me. It sets the tone for my day, the sound. It's uplifting, it's encouraging. Sound is a gift from God. And so we can't walk out of Psalms without at least addressing this idea of sound and maybe sometimes the absence of it. And so today I want to take you to Psalms 100. If you have your Bibles, please turn there with me. You know, Psalms 100 is what we see in there is the psalmist talks about sound and particularly he phrases it into the word of noise. He says, joyful noise, right? In Psalms 100 is a very short psalm, it's, it's, but it's packed full of all kinds of great things. But in its, in its existence, in its form, it's super simple. If you just read it, you kind of get the understanding of what God needs you to get out of Psalms 100. It's short, it's powerful, it's basically outlining a way of life for the worshiper, the Christian, the believer. It's the, it's the why, the where, the when, the what. It really is if you just take a moment to read it. As a matter of fact, for me, when I look at it and I read it, Psalms 100 is echoing this idea or this requirement that Jesus exposes or expresses uh, with the woman at the well in John 4 when he talks about God is looking for those who worship in spirit and truth. They're looking, he's looking for us to worship him with all of our being. And ultimately, we know that what Psalms is about, all 150 of them are about the human relationship, the human emotion, the connection with God, the expression of e anxiety and, and elation and victory and depression and love, and all that is, is wrapped up in 150 Psalms. And it's all expressed through sound, through speech music and words and it's from the heart it's with spirit and truth so if we read Psalms 100 I'll read it here 
It says, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know the Lord, he is good. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. It's super simple, right? It spells it out right there. If we just really wanted to break it down, I, you know, sometimes I have to look at Scripture from a different perspective. And so I, when I went to, to study this months ago, I, I, I read from five up to one. And what I got out of this is exactly this, is that God is good. God is loving. God is faithful. We're to give thanks to him because he is God. And he made us. More importantly, he calls us his. He invites us into a relationship with him and fellowship with him. So therefore, we should worship him with what? With singing of gladness and joy. That's Psalms 100. Simple, right? I told you. Well, that's it. That's it. That's all there is. Where's the band? <laughs> no. 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 Uh, while it's simple, it still deserves our attention. It really does. Because it's a call of action. It's a call of the worshiper. It's a call of the heart of the believer. It's a command. If you really want to break it down, it's a command. It's this idea of worship. The call is for us believers, but not only us. What does it say? It says, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth, all of creation. It's a call for everyone, non-believer, believer alike. Scripture tells us that the rocks know it, the trees know it, all of creation knows it. Just because you're not a believer does not mean you're absent of his love. He still loves you. Whether you want to accept him or not, he still beckons for you. He still calls for you. He still wants a relationship with you. He's inviting us. This is what Psalms, the psalmist in 100 is saying to us. He's inviting us into a unique and specific fellowship with him, regardless of where we're at. All creation. It's a command. See, what we, what we often get messed up is that the quality of our worship isn't, isn't really determined by our hands and our feet and our mouth or the movements we wake. It's more determined about our life and what we offer up to him, what we offer to him. And is it pleasing to him? Is it a joyful noise? Is it giving thanks to him? Is it done with gladness? Even when we don't feel like it. You remember that? That's what the psalmist is saying. It's about an attitude. It's about the attitude of worship. It's, it's joy, it's gladness, and thanksgiving. It's, it's, it's this moment of being completely surrendered to who he is. Look, I, you know, worship is, is difficult for some people in the, in, in, in the fact that we feel like we have to give up our, our personality or our uniqueness or, or who we are. You know, we have those people that are stoic in their worship. You know, hands in pockets and they stand there. And that's okay. God's not requiring you to give that up. We have those people that are unencumbered and they dance and they wave hands and whatnot. And that's okay too. And we have those people that just really don't know what to do. They stay seated. And that's okay. He's not asking you to give that up. He's not asking you to put your unique personality aside to worship him. But what he is asking us and what he does require is for us to kill our sin. To give it up. When we come to him in worship, what he wants us to do is remove all the things that keep us from worshiping him with joy, gladness, and thanksgiving. Even when we don't feel like it. Remove those things, those things that keep us locked up. Be like those men in prison. Regardless of their situation, they opened up their hearts. And they made a joyful noise. They sung at the top of their lungs. 
Look, I know that some of us are socially awkward, and, 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 but here's the thing. I want to try to give some, some help here is that if we're socially awkward and, and we're more worried about what the person next to us is thinking of us when we're singing or we're raising our hands, here's what I believe God is, it, it needs you to hear is that he needs you to hear, stop focusing on them, focus on me. Focus on me. Focus on who I am. Focus, just like the psalmist says in 100. Enter into my gates with gladness and thanksgiving. You know, we also have various different, you know, that stoic personality is sometimes that controlling A-type individual who, you know, is, is, is um, it has this inability to, to relinquish control over their life. And that means in anything. They, they have to maintain the same disposition wherever they go. I can't. But maybe if that's you, maybe God is telling you to humble yourself. Maybe God is telling you to humble yourself and, and let that go and give glory to God in your humility, in that moment. Let that go. Let your heart open up. Let your mouth open and give praises and thanksgiving to God Make a joyful noise. Find yourself prostrate on the ground and worship him and praise him. Because why? The psalmist says because he is good. He loves you and you are his. And he's worthy of it. Or maybe you're the person that came in here today and you're struggling with anger, frustration, discouragement. Can anybody relate? I know there's been times where I've walked in here and I felt that way. I've had that permanent scowl on my face. You know those people, right? They have the frown, and they just look angry. I've been accused of that guy. <laughs> but there can be something, sometimes there's just so much in our life, there's so much noise in our life that's not joyful, and it's not glad, and it's not full of thanksgiving, that it creates that in, that in us. But God is just saying, stand here in my presence. Enter into my court. Make a joyful noise. He's asking us to lay down whatever that is. He's asking us to remove that from our life and worship him wholly and completely. Look, we have to understand that, that God is not only here with us. He's not just in this very place with us today. He's not just here in this very moment in, in, the, in the two songs that we did this morning or the two songs that we'll end with. He's not just in that moment. He's not just here when we walk through the doors on a Sunday. We have to know that, that God is with us wherever we go and we're no more, we're, we're, we're just as close to him in his courts as the psalmist says, here as we are out there in our home, at our job, or wherever we're at, in a hospital. We're just as close to him. And he requires us to give him praise and to make a joyful noise. In order to do that, but we have to know him. This is what the psalmist is talking about. He says, we have to know the Lord, to know that he is God, to know that he created us, that he calls us his, that he calls us into something beautiful. When we worship, we are to have knowledge of God. And, and we can't worship properly if we're hearing all this other noise and we're taking in all this other noise and all these other things in our life and we're not worshiping God. We're not knowing God. We're not getting in his word and hearing the sound of his voice. So part of our worship and what the psalmist is trying to express is that we are to know God when we worship. Our worship shouldn't just be dependent on dim lights and music and swaying back and forth. Our worship should be a part of our life. And the things that we do, we are called to worship him in spirit and truth. Remember, that's the head and the heart, even when we don't feel like it. You know, it's been my personal experience that the more I know about God, the more I'm able to, the more I'm able to just spontaneously and intuitively worship him, relationally, wherever I'm at, in every moment. There used to be this man in town, I'd hear him all the time when I go to Walmart, he would just sing worship songs. He had a beautiful voice. And that triggered that in me. I was like, oh, if I am who I say I am, I should worship him wherever I am and be unafraid. 
So when I know more about God and I know more about who he says I am and whose I am, I'm more inclined to worship freely like those men in prison. Oh, how he loves. Psalmist goes on to say is that we are to give thanks and blessings. See, the substance of our worship is just this. It's just that. It really is. It's to worship him. It's to give thanks and give blessings. Because why? Psalmist tells us. Because he's good. He created us. His steadfast love endures forever. His faithfulness is ours. He gives that to us. He invites us into a relationship with him, into his house. You, me, get to stand before the creator of the whole world and offer up our simple voice, our life in worship. That's amazing to me. He made us. We are his. He wants that relationship with us. And part of our life is to worship him and share in that with him. The noises we should make should be filled full of joy and it should be filled full of gladness, gladness, just as the psalmist says. We are truly worshiping. We should truly worship him in, in, in spirit and truth. And it's this whole invokes this whole idea that Jesus talks about in Luke 10, 27. Heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's everything you got. That's all of you. Every piece. But what do we do? <laughs> what do we do when the sounds become too loud? Or... The noise is no longer joyful. Can anybody relate to that? You ever ask yourself that question, just as there are sounds that can produce the feeling of elation and, and connection and love and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness and all those things, there are, are sounds that can produce the opposite in us. They can wreck us. They can drive us so far away from God. But what do we do? So what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? God gives us such a great way to manage these things, but we just have to know him, once again, as the psalmist dictates in Psalm 100. We have to be careful because when we allow that stuff to infiltrate us and we're not allowing God's word, God's sound, God's voice, God's uh, uh, presence for us to influence our response, our joyful noise, we can pollute our lives. We can pollute the lives of others with our noise. Maybe you know that person. Maybe you've been that person. I can't stand up here honestly and tell you that I have never been that one. There have been many times where I've had to repent and ask God to forgive me for the noise that I have made. But these noises, they sound like all kinds of things. The noises of life that, that can pollute us and pollute our lives and the people around us. They sound like all different kinds of things and, and uh, they, can be, um, they can be formed in, in, in many different ways. They can be financial problems. Um, they can be disagreement with your spouse or with your friends. They can come in, um, <laughs> in the way of the, the guy that cut you off in traffic. <laughs> I mean, you really can these noises that produce something other than joy in you. Or it can be in just this. It can be just in this. That noise that produces pollution in you can just be the devil's scheme and him telling you you're not worthy. You're not worthy. You're not ready. Or they think you're not worthy. Or they think you're not ready to do what God has called you to do. I've dealt with that. And if I'm being completely honest, I still do. There's all kinds of noises in our life that can distract us and, and deter us from what God needs us to hear and takes the joy out of our response and the gladness out of our response. You know, I had this friend. I, God is so amazing. It's like as I studied for this, God continue to put people in my life to, to help me formulate this message. And I have this friend that I'm so proud of him. He's trying to quit smoking. And he called me up and he's like, man, I'm just trying to quit smoking. I want to be done with this. I don't want to have control of my life. And I'm like, amen, brother, right? I'm like, put that stuff down. Yeah, don't let it control your life. He's like, but every time I, I just want to and then I, and I put, I just can't. And I'm like, he's like, 
I'm like, I, do, I just want to be done with it. And, and I said, well, what did you do? He said, I lit that cigarette, and as soon as I lit that cigarette, I took it out of my mouth, I threw it out of the ground, and I beat the life out of it with a shovel. <laughs> beat the life, making noises the entire time. <laughs> Joyful noises, I'm sure. Right? I love that. I often instruct men to do that, like when they're struggling with something. Hey, go out into the woods, go out into your garage, you know, and cry. Cry out. Cry out. God considers that a joyful noise if you're surrendered to it. You know, like my friend, and really, if I, it, it, once again, if I'm being fully transparent, what provoked this message for you guys today over the past several months is that my, my mind, my mind has been full of a lot of noise. And several weeks ago when my wife left to go visit my daughter, she was gone for two weeks, I felt like it, it just escalated. And I, I found myself sitting at home in my living room alone and just overthinking. Any overthinkers in here? <laughs> just overthinking. I mean, just so much noise. So much noise. I couldn't shut it off. And that noise, that overthinking led to not sleeping. It led to thoughts racing in my mind. And some good, some bad, some sad. But just a lot of noise. And what I realized in that moment is that, you know, is that my, my wife, my family is my buffer. See, when my wife and my children are home, I can focus on them. I can focus on being the best version of them that God needs me to be for them, and I can, and I can drown out the noise. See, what the science of psychoacoustics tell you is that you can drown out bad noise with good noise. And I missed that. I missed my wife singing in the morning. And so naturally... As the night went, you know, my days would progress and they would just stem in my head and I, and, and, and I just couldn't catch a moment of, of, of peace. And so what I did, unlike my friend in the shovel, <laughs> is I went to music. That's, that's my thing. So I went to music, and I went to music, and I started playing. I started, started with secular songs, and it turned it in with worship songs, and I started singing, and I just was singing at the top of my lungs, and I know my youngest son was there. He probably heard me wailing like a cat. I did not care if I was in tune. What I needed to do was express me. He's over there shaking his head, by the way. I was just expressing my heart at the time. I was like, God, God, please, please, please. And, and so that, that playing guitar and that singing led to worship in my heart and in my, in, in my, in, in my being. And that, that worship led to prayer. And that prayer led me to quiet. And that quiet led me to sleep. And God is good. He's amazing. And each morning I wake up and I feel a little refreshed. But you know what I did? I did the same thing I bet every one of you do. I picked it right back up and put it right back on like a set of Beats headphones. And the noise came back. After a few days of this, I finally just said, okay, God, I need you to take this from me. And you know what I heard in the silence in that moment? I heard very clearly, I need you to give this to me. Maybe somebody here today can relate to that. Maybe there's something you need to give. Inherently, we say that, right? God, I'm going to give this to you. But really, it's hard for us to really give up anything. It's just who we are. It's part of the sin nature. We really don't want to give it up. But God requires that of us. So I don't know, maybe you guys have different things that you, you deal with to keep the noise down in your head. But for me, that was like a supernatural punch to the heart. And it's not the first time I've been there with God. I just listened. I listened in the silence. And I heard Him. And I surrendered. 
So there are many things in our life that create noise. And as a part of our life, we can produce those noise. We can produce good sound and we can produce bad sound. And so we should really ask ourselves at some point in our life is what kind of noise are we making? Better yet, what kind of noise are you listening to? Is it played out in your life, in your actions, in your speech, in your conversations, in your relationships? What kind of noise are you making? And what kind of noise are you listening to? It's, look, I know it's easy to put on a face and pretend that you're making a joyful noise, right? You ever heard the watermelon analogy? And if you don't know the words to a song, just sing watermelon. Tr try it, right? No, no. We can't pretend to make a joyful noise. God knows. When we do this, we run the risk of, like I said, polluting so many lives around us. And essentially, we become the noise. As I said, this is not what God intended for us at all. It's really not. It, the noise is, it, it, that God desires does not draw attention to the noise maker. The noise that God desires us to make is joyful and full of gladness and thanksgiving and draws attention to him. This is our life, and it should be done out of love for him. This is what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 13 as he says we are like clanging gongs. He goes, I could speak in the, the tongues of men and angels, but if I don't do it with love, then I'm like a clanging gong. Our motion, our movement to make a joyful noise comes out of love for who God is and his love for us. Remember, the psalmist even reminds us of God's character. He is good. He is loving and faithful. His steadfast love endures forever. In this, God gives us such a better way of managing the noise in our life. He really does. I'm going to talk about that just in a minute. But you know, as I read through this and I thought about this and I prayed and I meditated on God's word and scripture, I couldn't help but to just think about Elijah. The story of Elijah. If you've never read the story of Elijah, I encourage you to go do it. You can find it in 1 Kings 18, 36 through 40. Elijah was confronted. He was a great prophet of God. He did a lot of things for the Lord. Great big things. Huge things. But he came down to this one moment with this one person who said one thing about him who struck fear in his heart and discouragement in him. And he said, oh, nobody's getting what God's doing. And so he ran and he hid. He ran and he hid and he found himself in a situation removed from the Lord. But the Lord does what? The Lord is good, he's great, and, and, and he is awesome, and we are his. And so what he did, he sought him out, and he woke him up. Woke him up with an angel and gave him food and gave him water, allowed him to rest. And then he called him away. He called him into a quiet place. Who needs a quiet place here today? Me. Me called him into a quiet place. And what we see transpire in this is that um, it says in Elijah's story that he's in this cave on this mountainside and it says the Lord made a great wind he said the Lord made a great earthquake and it said the Lord uh, uh, made a great fire I can imagine the sound of those moments can you you ever heard a roaring fire a big one a massive wind it's noisy right I've never been in an earthquake, thank God, but I'm sure it's loud too. But what do we hear in Scripture? What do we see? What do we read in Scripture? It says the Lord was not in the wind. The Lord was not in the earthquake. The Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, it says, though a sound of a low whisper came. And he called Elijah to the edge of the cave. And there is where God spoke. And he simply says, Elijah, why are you here? This, why are you here, the statement is a provocation not of why are you here in the cave. It's remember why, you he why you're here. Remember whose you are. Remember who you are. And remember what I purposed you to do. And your life should represent that. Sometimes God does call us to a quiet place. In a quiet moment, like he did me, like I shared with you. Maybe even my friend as he stood outside with that shovel and that cigarette butt to remember whose we are, who we are in Him. 
and what he's called us to do. So what do we do with this? What does this mean to us? Scripture reminds us that when the noise of life happens, just as in Elijah's life, you have things like, like immorality and impurity and, 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 and envy and strife and amnity and jealousy and anger and, and division and dissension all come up. Those are the, the non-joyful noises. They all penetrate our mind. In our hearts, they leave us lost. They leave us disconnected with other believers. They leave us alone and abandoned, possibly. But here, the psalmist in Psalms 100 continues to remind us of God's love. We are his, and if we are his and he created us, he calls us to what? Be in his court. And when we're in his court, he calls us to walk in the spirit, the fruit of the spirit, that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, all that, the self-control, the faithfulness, all of that. It's no wonder that love begets joy. It is his love for us that produces the joy in our heart. And he calls us to know him, to know him. When the fruit of the Spirit dominates our lives, we cannot help but to express it. We just can't. That joyful noise that we get when we are truly surrendered and we know God and we walk in all of those fruits, those things, come out in so many different ways. It comes out in praise and dancing and singing and clapping, uh, scripture reading, raising hands, shouting, and playing instruments. But really, really, but, but, but most importantly, it comes out in our life, in our actions. This is what God requires of us. And like I said, but sometimes the noise is so loud, God does require us to get away. I'm not saying not be still and be quiet because it's sure God called Elijah into that cave for a reason. He called him away into the quiet. He called him into the, the confines of the cave to be his refuge and his strength in that moment where Elijah was discouraged and downhearted so he could remind him. And you know where we see this played out in Psalms? Again, I'm sure, look, I will tell you, we see it played out time and time again in all 150 songs. God is our refuge, He's our strength, He's our fortress. But where I found it was in Psalms 46.10. 46.10 is this, it's be still and know that I am God, I will be exalted among the nations, I will be exalted in the earth. You know, we misplace or misuse that and we, we take that be still as, as a as a as a command to just be quiet. Look, and once again, I'm not discounting that there is scripture. God does call us to be quiet. Matter of fact, Paul talks about it in 1 Thessalonians 4, somewhere 11 and 12, to the quiet life. He calls a Christian to the quiet life. But this, be still, is not about being quiet. This, be still, is a command. The Hebrew word that we find that's used in Psalms 46.10 for to be still or to still, or, or the word still, is rafa, which inherently means to sink down, to relax, to let go, to cease striving or withdraw. What we have to understand is that the command in Psalms 46.10 for our, us, the believer, is this. It's not a command to serenity. It's not to be given over to serenity. It's to be surrendered absolutely surrendered remember the context of the verse if you go back and you read all of psalms 46 which i would love to have done but we just don't have time it outlines that a war is going on a battle is going on there's just absolute enmity and strife and and, and 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 aggression coming forth to the nation of israel it's a moment of conflict so it can't be a call to be quiet it's a call and a command to stop fighting. Stop fighting in your own flesh. Stop fighting with your own tools. Stop fighting with your own person, your own being. It's a command to be still. It's, it means to stop the frantic activity, the running around, the, 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 the words in your mouth, the thoughts in your heads, whatever it is that's causing you to do whatever you're doing and not make the joyful noise. It's a cause to give up, lay down your weapons, and let God fight the battle for you. 
That's what be still and know I'm God is about. Maybe we can put it a different way. Think of Jesus in Luke 8 where he's with the the disciples on the boat and and they're scared, they're terrified, and the storm happens. And they're running around on the boat. They're throwing life preservers, whatever they're doing. And there's our Lord and Savior, our beautiful Jesus, and it says that his head was on a pillow. (laughs) Man, my strength and my refuge. They wake him up, and what does he do? What does he say? He says, be still. Be still. God's got it. God's in control. We can never forget that. No matter what noise we're hearing, no matter what noise is is coming in, no matter what noise is being produced in our life, God is in control, and he requires us to give it to him. And he will silence that noise. He will fight the battle. The battle belongs to him. Amen? Once again, it is not a call to serenity. It's a call of surrender. Be still means to cease fighting and let him do it. When we focus our hearts, the focus of our hearts is God, his love, his greatness, his power, and giving thanks to him and his steadfast love. Something happens in us. We have that peace. We have that joy. We have those things that we read about in Galatians 5.22. And his word reminds us who he is, just as the psalmist did in Psalms 100, just as Psalms 46 does. It reminds us who he is. And, he, and, and, and better yet, the psalmist tells us that in those moments, our noise is, 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 is like a sweet sound to his ear. Our prayers, our cries for help. Our cry for rest. He invites that. In that, God will make his glory surely known to you if you could just be still and surrender. He reminds us who he is and he calls us to worship him in every facet of our life, the good and the bad. He calls us to be still and remember who he is, to be still and stop fearing, to stop being anxious, to stop fighting, to stop worrying. He calls us to be still and give it to him. He calls us to be still and allow him to take control. He calls us to be still and let him do whatever he needs to do and give it to him. He calls us to acknowledge him in his greatness and be still. Look, the book of Psalms reminds us ultimately that we have access to one of the greatest blessings that we could all have and that is to the Creator's presence, but we so often, what? Try to work it all out in our flesh. We produce noise. Or we allow the noise to produce something in us when really we should be listening to the call of the Father, His love and His gratefulness. And remember whose we are, who we are, and what He's purposed us to do, and that is to worship Him with our heart, mind, soul, and strength, every piece of our life. God's infinite love is for us. And we're to understand that he desires that true relationship with us. And when we are given over to it, (laughs) we cannot help but to make a joyful noise. All the Psalms reflects us reaching out to God for help and God extending his hand to rescue us from all of our troubles and all of our struggles. But sometimes it just requires us to be still and give it to him. Better yet, requires us to be still, make a joyful noise and give it to him. Cry out. That's a joyful noise to God. Cry out. Cry out. God, I need you to take this. But be prepared for him to say, I need you to give it to me. So now what? What do we do with this? Well, let us consider once again the psalmist's observation in Psalms 46.10, be still and know I am God is what he says. He says, I will be exalted amongst all nations and I will be exalted in the earth. So today, that's our charge. That's our challenge. Whatever the noise is, whatever is going on in your life, make a joyful noise. Do it with gladness and thanksgiving. Stand in the courts of God and sing at the top of your lungs. Pray, find yourself prostrate on the ground, face down, worship, crying. Whatever it is, just give it to him. 
Do what you were created to do. Stop. Don't get discouraged, family, or get caught up or be distracted by the noise of the world. Recognize you're not in control. He is. And His plan is far better than yours, and His ways are far greater than yours. And His resolution will produce more joy, more love, more, more peace, more patience, more kindness, more gentleness, more self-control than we could ever fathom if we would just stop and be still and recognize who He is. We also need to refocus in this moment. We, need, we can quickly get discouraged. We can get quickly uh, off track with God. and We can lose sight of Him and his, his purpose for our life and His plan for our lives with all the noise and the things going on. And He just requires us sometimes to just focus on Him. Just focus on Christ. Take peace in knowing God is the only one who can calm the storm in your life. Put Him first in everything you do. And lastly, what we can do is rest. We can make sure that we're resting. More importantly, we can make sure that we're resting in Him. God is our refuge. He is our strength. He's our fortress. When you're tired and the noise is too much, and you need a place to go, God has given you a quiet place in Him. The problem is, is that we don't seek it. So find rest. Seek Him. Seek Him in your safe place. What He does is He gives you an opportunity to eat and drink and refresh you. Eat and drink and refresh you and remind you of why you were here just like He did Elijah. And remind you of whose you are so that you understand His love, His goodness, His power, His greatness. And when you do, you can't help but to acknowledge Him with a joyful noise. <clears throat> so today, let's just do that. Let's just make a joyful noise. Let's just turn off everything that influences us against God and make a joyful noise to Him. Acknowledge who He is and spread the knowledge of Him to everyone. Make beautiful noises, joyful noises. Point people to Him in everything we do, in every aspect of our life. Through our speech, our work, our worship, our study, our friendships, our marriages, our giving, our talents. Make a joyful noise, family. Give praise thanksgiving with gladness to the God because he, because he is good and He created you and you were His. And I don't know, maybe you're just not there today or maybe you are and you're trying to figure this out and maybe you're just ready. Maybe you're just ready to be still and know God. If that's you, I'm here. We have other people here, other ministry leaders here that can help you answer that question today. If that's you, find me. If I can't help you, I'll point you to somebody that can. But maybe you just need to be still and know God and consider your, your, your life in Christ Jesus. And so as we close this message, we come to a time of worship. And worship, as we've all said, is just not song. Worship is our life. It's the noise that we make. It's the actions that we produce. We can worship through our giving. We can worship through prayer. We can worship through everything. We can worship through communion. Communion is back here in the back, on the right. If you need prayer, it's over here on the left. That's worship. That's giving praise and thanksgiving. In your moment of communion, maybe that's your prayer for you. God, I need you to take this from me. I need you to help me to be still and know who you are in my life as you eat the bread and you drink from the cup and you understand the sacrifice and the love of Christ Jesus that he died for you and he was raised from the dead for you because he loved you. And just that thought should invoke you to make a joyful noise. So let's do that today. Let's just make a joyful noise for you. If you'll pray with me. Father God, I just thank you Thank you for the gift of 
sound. Lord, we know that everything that is created is done for your good. God, let us embrace that moment. Let us be fully surrendered. Let us not seek serenity in our life, but let us seek surrender and safety in you. God, I ask that you just give us always a quiet place in, in your heart. And you help us be restored to you in our lives, in our word, in our speech, in our actions, in everything we do, in our relationships. And whatever we do, Lord, help us. Help us to grow in our thanksgiving and rejoice to the world that you are good, that you are God, and your love is steadfast and it endures forever. Let that be our joyful noise to the world and our proclamation of hope and the testimony of Jesus Christ in our life. It is in Jesus' name.